Welcome back. You're watching McLaren Port Huron's Today's Health, and we're talking with board certified urologist Dr. Glenn Beatrice, and we're talking about treatment for kidney stones in this segment. So, you talked a little bit about them in the last segment, but let's um, go a little deeper. Can you tell me about ESWL? Sure. So, ESWL is performed as an outpatient. As I said, the bean bag is either placed on the patient's lower back or on the front. Uh, the patient is actually not put to sleep in most instances. Usually the patient is simply given a sedative medication through the IV, so they kind of drift off to sleep. We have an x-ray monitor in the room to be able to position the patient so that the shock waves are aimed directly at the stone. So looking at this diagram here, you've got several stones within the kidney. We would position the patient so that the, we'll say we're breaking up the stone here. We would put that stone in the crosshairs, it's just like a rifle sighting. Then we would initiate or uh, administer the shock waves. This is a depiction of the shock waves going through the kidney, breaking up the stones into these small particles, and then of course the particles have to pass out. So that procedure, as I say, is done as an outpatient. It takes about 45 minutes to do. The patient wakes up quickly, goes home. Uh, they generally feel a little bit sore that day in the kidney area, somewhat better the next day, and typically back to normal uh, by the second day after the procedure. The only exception to that, of course, is if they're passing kidney stones. And then if you, in a perfect world, the stones break up into little particles that are like grains of sand, and they flush right out, and it's a real, real easy recovery. If somebody has a larger fragment to pass, then it can be more difficult to pass those fragments. Now when you say shockwave, I'm thinking electric shockwave. Does it feel like that, a pulsing? No, it or? actually feels like a thumping. Um, it's an uh, ultrasonic shockwave, and when you put your hand up against it, it's a little bit like that. And the treatment is given at a rate of 80 shocks per minute. So you hear this tapping sound, it's a continuous tapping sound, as the shock waves are administered and aimed at the stones. So you can actually see then when the stone is breaking up. Correct, so we have an x-ray monitor that we use periodically throughout the procedure to be able to tell if the stone is or is not breaking up. We utilize that information to determine how many shocks to give. In that diagram there, there were four stones. We might break up one stone once that's sufficiently broken up, then reposition the patient so we can treat the second stone and the third stone and so on. And once the patient goes home, and if there are little stones to pass, how long does that take? So it can take, uh, a, it's highly variable. So some patients, particularly the uh, patients that have stones in the ureters, those stones, that's kind of ideal because the stone is already in the ureter, so once it breaks up, the pieces just go down. Mm -hmm. Here, the problem here is that as this stone breaks up, some of the pieces might go out, but some of the pieces might fall down here. So there are different ways of defining the success of ESWL. One way of defining it is to say, did the stone break up? But the other way is to say, did all the stone fragments pass out? And uh, unfortunately, the success rate as defined by it breaking up is higher than the stone fragments all passing. So then that might be something that you would have to uh, address later? Correct. So there are times that we might have to do lithotripsy a second time. For example, if there was a stone fragment that was too large to pass after ESWL, we might have to repeat the ESWL. Okay. We even do something that it might sound funny, it's called inversion therapy, where we have patients kind of lie on their side, even stand on their head a little bit, to try to get the stones out of here into here so that they'll pass out. And this, but this is the least invasive. This is the least invasive. Oh, and this is called a lithotripsy. This is called lithotripsy. Lithotripsy is a broad term. Uh, lithotripsy means to break up a stone. So if you hear somebody say lithotripsy, they're probably referring to ESWL. But when we go up with the scope and use a laser to break the stone up, that's also a form of lithotripsy. All right, well, speaking of laser, tell me about the Holmium laser then. So the Holmium laser, is, it's a glass fiber that can be passed through a scope. It transmits Holmium laser energy, and Holmium laser energy breaks stones up. 
So the trick there, the trick with ESWL is hoping that the shock waves will effectively break up the stone. And the likelihood that the stone will break up with ESWL is 70 to 75 percent. With the homium laser, if you get the homium laser up to the stone, the chances of the stone breaking up are 100 percent. So the trick there isn't the effectiveness of the laser, it's being able to get to the stone. So for that situation, you pass the scope up into the bladder, up the ureter, up to where the stone is. So we'd pass the scope right up to that area. So then you've got the stone right in front of you. You pass the laser probe through the scope. And then once the laser probe is directly in front of the stone, you apply the laser energy to break the stone up into little particles. And you can see that happening right while you you're doing it. You can see that happening visually, whereas the ESWL, you're determining the success by looking at an x-ray monitor. With the laser procedure, you're actually looking at a TV monitor that's in real time. You're watching everything you're doing as if it's on television. And you've got the laser there. You're breaking the stone up. You can change the laser settings so that you can, if the stone is particularly dense or hard, we might have to apply a higher uh, amount of energy in order to break the stone up into small enough particles to pass. And what does the patient feel in all of this? So for this procedure, the patient actually is totally put to sleep. Okay. Uh, so it's, as I say, a bit more of an invasive procedure. The patient's asleep as opposed to sedated with ESWL. We're passing a scope up into the urinary tract. Uh, so, but during the procedure, the patient, of course, doesn't feel anything. After the procedure, the patient probably has a bit more discomfort than with ESWL. We usually place a tube called a stent. A stent is like a long skinny straw that goes from the kidney down to the bladder because the ureter can go into spasm mm. after you pass the scope there. And then the, if the ureter was in spasm, the urine would back up into the kidney and the patient would have kidney pain as if their stone was blocking the ureter. So we use a stent to allow the kidney to drain until that period of spasm alleviates. But unfortunately, some patients have some discomfort as a result of the stent. And so then recovery time? Um, it depends how you define recovery time. I mean, somebody could probably go back to work the next day after that procedure, after either of these procedures, really. But I would say people are a bit more uncomfortable after the laser procedure for up to a week or so. And then let's talk a little bit about the larger stones. Is there another surgical procedure? So there is. The problem with the procedures we've already talked about with a large stone in the kidney, if we did lithotripsy on a large stone in the kidney, you've got to pass all those pieces. So the bigger the stone is, the more there is to pass. And so with a stone that exceeds, we'll say, two centimeters in size, we would not want to do ESWL because there's just simply too much stone material to have to pass. Likewise, going up with the scope and using the homium laser, if the stone is too big, it creates a lot of debris that's floating around. It limits your visualization, and it can just be too cumbersome to break up a stone that's too large and ultimately too time-consuming. So for those procedures, or for those stones, rather, what we usually recommend is a procedure called a percutaneous nephrolithotomy. What that procedure consists of is to make a small incision in the back, uh, pass a scope directly through that incision into the kidney, and then once you've got a larger scope in the kidney, the benefit of a larger scope is that you can pass a larger probe through a larger scope. So instead of using a small homium laser probe through a small scope, we have an ultrasonic device that can pass through the large scope that ultrasonic device grinds up the stone and simultaneously suctions the pieces of the mm -hmm. stone out of the kidney. So you're both breaking up the stone and removing the pieces simultaneously. But that is a procedure that's done under general anesthesia. It takes about two hours to perform the procedure, and the patient does remain hospitalized after that procedure, typically for one to three days. Can ignoring your kidney stone damage your, your urinary tract? So if the stone is in the kidney, the answer is no. A stone, a 20-year-old could have a stone in the kidney and have it for the rest of their lives and it never caused them a problem if it never moved and never grew. The problem is that stones tend to grow and they tend to move. A stone in the ureter long-term can cause problems because if the kidney is blocked for an extended time period, uh, that patient can lose partial or complete function of that kidney. 
You've given us such great information. Do you have any closing comments? No, uh, just simply, I guess, a word of uh, advice in terms of kidney stone prevention would be to increase fluid intake, again, water, lemonade, orange juice, uh, decrease the meat and salt in the diet. If you have pain in the kidney area, that's certainly not the only cause of pain in the kidney area, but it would certainly be something that one would want to consider if they're having those symptoms. And an x-ray, particularly a CAT scan, would be the test of choice in order to diagnose that. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us. If you have any questions about anything we talked about today, you can email us at mclaren.org forward slash ph contact. Or you know you can watch any segment of this program or any of our other Today's Health programs at mclaren.org forward slash phth. We hope you join us again next week for Today's Health. Today's Health is brought to you by McLaren Port Huron.